Let's go back seven years. I'm still a freshman in the high school, and I'm sitting in a room in my house we call the Blue Room. High schooler Yalavir has only one thing on his mind, raycasting. So when a data packer needs to figure out where a player is looking or where a bullet from a gun is going, they use raycasting. There's a common problem with raycasting that the data pack community just kind of accepts. To see if a sightline hits a block, you need to use a series of dots to check for blocks. This is fine for flat walls, but what about diagonal walls? See how thin it is where the corners touch? Dots can easily skip over that. One of my goals back in high school was to find a pattern of dots that would be guaranteed to detect even diagonal walls. I failed back then, but today I'm giving it another shot. This is not the first time I've reattempted this puzzle. Back in September of 2021, I released Infiltrating the Stronghold, a data pack that turns strongholds into stealth dungeons. In this dungeon resides an organic security system of eyeballs that alert the silverfish to the presence of players. These mobs are called Watchers. The Skulk Watcher in particular uses ray casting to detect when a player is in its line of sight. When it sees a player, the Skulk tendrils on top of it begin to trill, alerting the silverfish in the nearby walls. There are a couple of requirements for this to work. One, I need to know when any type of wall is blocking the Skulk Watcher from seeing the player. Two, I need to know when the player has been found so the raycasting can end. The first one's a bit tricky because there are three types of walls to be concerned about. Flat walls, diagonal walls, and triagonal walls. Which I know isn't what it's really called, but I can't think of a better name right now. Flat walls are easy, as I have explained before, but we'll have to think up solutions for diagonal and triagonal walls. On the other hand, detecting entities also has some technical challenges. A principle I designed Skulk Watcher with is it can only see you if you can see it see you. Basically, I care more about if it can look you in the eye than if it can spot your feet poking out from under a curtain. How the game detects entities are anchored at different points on the body, which means we'll have to jump through some hoops to get that working. Looks like we've figured out what sort of work is ahead of us. First, we'll find a solution for diagonal walls. Next, triagonal. Then we'll work on entity detection. Spoiler alert, the last one involves dancing around some known bugs. Let's hurry up and figure out diagonal walls. This type of wall is always perpendicular to a 2D plane, which means we can actually think about it in two dimensions. As we go down the sight line, which is another name for the ray we are casting, we detect blocks using dots on the line as normal. In order to detect the diagonal wall, we will also need to add dots perpendicular to the line on each side. If both dots detect a block, we know we found a diagonal wall. If only one of the side dots finds a block, we're probably okay, there is a chance we're clipping a corner slightly, but as long as it's close enough to open space, it's fine. If we make the distance between the line and these extra dots too large, it might overshoot the blocks. If we make it too small, then we run into the same issue that the dots on the main line have. Eventually, I found that our perfect medium is half the diagonal of a square, which is the square root of 2 over 2. This simplifies to 1 over the square root of 2. We can actually represent this pattern as the corners of a square that is the same size as the blocks we are dealing with. As you can see, this still isn't enough at certain angles. The final touch is that we can compare a corner with the opposite corner of the check that came before it. In other words, either we get two of the same color or two of the same letter. Keen Eye may have noticed that this is too large to fit for a one block gap. What we can do is start off with this large scale version, then when it thinks it hit a wall, switch to a half scale version to double check. As long as you cut in half all the distances, it will stay to scale and continue to work. The reason we don't just only use the half-scale version is that it performs twice as many checks per block. We were designing this in 2D, but Minecraft is clearly 3D. To upgrade this to 3D, we just make the small change from two dots besides the main dot to a plus shape, and we have our solution. Now that we've figured out the solution for diagonal walls, let's move on to triagonal walls. Dealing with triagonal walls is a problem I noticed only halfway through development, and it sort of dumbfounded me at first. Up until this point, I had been simulating the problem in 2D in GIMP. I actually had sort of a eureka moment on camera while working in GIMP, so here's a clip of me screaming in excitement and utter exhaustion.
things I hit. Have I found it? I think I found it. I think I found it. I did it. It's been four days. Yes. Yes. This problem isn't easily expressed in 2D, so I couldn't just drag shapes around in GIMP to solve it geometrically. It took a lot of head scratching, but here's how I was able to break it down. There are two types of triagonal walls, down facing and up facing. I know it seems like I'm completely ignoring the four cardinal directions here, but I don't want to get into a long discussion about local positioning and the limitations of block rotation in the voxel game, so just trust me on this. Or, well, Okay, I'll explain it a little bit. So you know how you can see blocks in this pattern in Minecraft? Well, if I rotate it 90 degrees, we get a configuration that doesn't actually exist in the game. Rotating it all around, and the only direction the trigonal wall actually exists in is up and down. Get it? Okay, cool. Next, I used a detail I noticed when I was working on the previous problem. If we take a moment and look back, we'll see the previous solution can be positioned to end on the exact center of each block it's detecting. My hypothesis is that the same will be true for any solution we make for the triagonal wall. Knowing this, I added one vector for each block starting at the corner where they all touch, with a length that is equal to half the diagonal of a cube, aka the square root of 3 over 2. This isn't actually the length you're seeing right now. If you look at it from another angle, you'll see these vectors lean forward like a tripod. This lean just pushes a check down the sight line, so it's best we factor it out. For those of you interested in the math, you can pause the video here. But TLDR, I factored the lean out of the vectors and got 1 over the square root of 2, which is fascinating. If you remember from earlier, the... Wait, what? Now for a corporate-mandated yoga break. Wait, Tokyo Industries. Hey. Laugh or cry. Just be consistent. Okay, so, while making this video, I actually noticed something I hadn't noticed before, and it blew my mind. Our vector without the lean is 1 over the square root of 2, aka half the diagonal of a square. Where have we heard that before? Right, it's the length of the vector we had for the solution to the diagonal wall problem. That'll come in handy later when we have to combine them. Let's finish what we're doing be right now before we get into that, though. At this point, we just go into the same final steps that we had before for the diagonal problem. We need a half-scale version that goes into more detail when we think we've hit a wall. Just like before, we will also have to compare the new results with the results of the previous iteration. Simple stuff, you've heard it before. We figured out what we need to do for the downward-facing triagonal wall. And now we just need to invert it for the upward-facing triagonal wall, and combine the two to get this six-dot configuration. Now we combine it with the plus configuration we got from the diagonal wall solution, and we get a pattern of nine dots. Notice I just combined a pattern of five dots with a pattern of six dots, but got nine dots in total, instead of eleven. Remember a moment ago when I said we'd come back to one over the square root of two? Well, we just figured out that this is the length of the vectors for the triagonal solution, but it also happens to be the exact same length as the vectors in the diagonal solution. This means that the highest and lowest dots from both solutions match up perfectly, so we can just combine them. And now we have our final pattern of dots. Each vector has a length of 1 over the square root of 2, each of the diagonal vectors are 30 degrees off of the x-axis, and that's all kind of clean. I'm actually really shocked it's not symmetrical over the line y equals x, which I've always just assumed was the case in all my previous attempts to solve this. Maybe that's part of why I've never been able to figure it out before. Now, there's one part of the puzzle I've been neglecting up until this point. What about the distance between the primary dots and the sight line? This is essential. Those dots are basically the middle dot on the pattern we just figured out. It's the dot that every other dot gets placed around. Based on the geometrical proof from the first solution, the distance should be half the diagonal of a square, aka 1 over square root of 2, which is a number we've seemed to love around here. But the second solution actually suggests that it should be half the diagonal of a cube, aka square root of 3 over 2, 
I'd make a graphic to explain how I came to that conclusion, but it doesn't matter because in testing, the number that worked was actually 0.5. Why? I have no freaking idea. My current hypothesis is that because 0.5 actually happens to be the same length as the lean we removed from the vectors in the triagonal solution, it might compensate for its removal. This means that all the math should be flawed, but I guess the fully working triagonal code somehow covers the gaps of the fully working diagonal code and vice versa. If you're confused, don't worry, I am too. But I won't argue with the empirical evidence. I did a robust amount of testing and never found a single edge case where it failed, so unless I'm missing something, it works. If any of you have a degree in mathematics, I'd love to hear your input. At the moment, I don't think I'm simply missing something in the testing, but it's certainly possible that this is still flawed and I've made a mistake. Now that we've figured out wall detection, still really excited about that by the way, we can move on to entity detection. There are two types of player detection. Distance and dy, dz, dx. Distance is the method of using a sphere to look for players. This only works if the player's feet are within the sphere. dy, dz, dx looks for players in a cube and can detect any part of the player. As stated earlier in the video, we care more about detecting the player when it's possible for them to see the thing that sees them, so we want to aim for the eyes. The circular selection works better mathematically, but it can only detect feet. Since our array is pointed at the eyes, we would need to offset the circle down to where the feet are. To make that possible, we would need to have a list of the distances between the eyes and the feet of every entity in the game. Not to mention, we would need to update this list every time they add a new entity. No way, let's go with cube selection. The goal is to select everything between the dots on a sight line. We don't want to go any farther than the dots because we don't know what's beyond the dot. It's unknown territory. The great beyond! <clears throat> Anyway, the first problem we run into with this is that we can't rotate the cube. In order to ensure the cube never reaches too far, we need to make sure the longest part of the cube is equal to the distance between the dots. The longest part of the cube is its diagonal, so we'll make that equal to our increment distance, which we decided was 0.5. dx, dy, and dz represent the edges of a cube, and we want to find their values to generate the cube. Some quick math and we get 1 over 2 times square root of 3. For each edge. Now we take this detection cube and place it on the sight line. To keep it from reaching too far, we center the middle of the detection cube halfway down the sight line. This is done by incrementing 0.25 backwards down the sight line. Then increment back half of the dx, dy, dz distances along the normal block grid. In case you're confused, when I refer to the normal block grid, I'm referring to the grid that all the blocks in Minecraft are aligned to. It's important to note that there is a slight gap in the detection system. And I mean like a literal physical gap, like there's a space between the box and the end of the line because we're only having the longest part of the cube actually reach all the way to the dot. And if you position it so the longest part of the cube isn't going along the dot, then you have like a little gap there. It's a little, it's, it's a real gap. It's a little gap. It's cute. It's cute. Cool. Anyway, so if a mob that has a side of their hitbox that is smaller than the gap, it could be missed. We can calculate the size of the gap when it's at its largest by taking the distance between the primary dots and subtracting by the edge of the entity detection cube. This gives us approximately 0.211324865405. The only entities in the game with at least one edge of their hitbox shorter than this length are markers, marker armor stands, area of effect clouds, item frames, and glow item frames. I could hard code these cases to use circular detection, but the Skulk Watcher won't be detecting these, so it's not necessary. Also, just a little side note, item frames? Why? Why do you go out of your way to be the thing that represents the gap and the perfect scenario? They go out of their way to be right on the edge of the block grid. It's like, when I think about it conceptually, they are just like the perfect enemy to what I am doing, and I hate them. Yeah. Moving on. So that would conclude the entity detection system. But this is all theory. In application, it failed utterly. 
every test I ran, every experiment I ran, I became more and more confused. I felt like pulling the freaking hair out. None of the results I was getting made any sense. But then Fabian, a shining beacon of hope, directed me to bug MC-123441, which I know sounds like a fake bug number, but it's real. Over to Denafrius in the field. Denafrius here. That's the Minecraft bug tracker. Looking at bug MC-123441. Inconsistent behavior of target selector arguments DX, DY, and DZ. If we look down here at the description, it states the following. The volume defined by target selector arguments DX, DY, and DZ is always larger than specified by one in all dimensions. For example, at E, DX equals zero, DY equals zero, and DZ equals zero, would select entity one block in front of the player. So basically what's going on here is that no matter what you do, the area you're trying to select, it's always one larger than you expect. Even if you go in the negative direction, it's then going to be one larger you expect in the negative direction. So when Galdivir was trying to select an area that was smaller than a full cube in Minecraft, it was always actually larger than a cube. I just got a message, so Denafri is out. Thank you, Denafrius. Our detection cube was intended to be smaller than a block, but it was actually much larger. With some advice from VDMan1 on the Minecraft Commands Discord, I created a cross-section between two cube detection regions to simulate the smaller cube, and voila, it worked like a charm. The theory was correct, I was not insane. Thank you! Oh my god, I thought I was insane. I was like, it was at this moment that the editor decided to spare you the insane ramblings of a madman. You're welcome. Anyway, I think that's everything! We figured out the patterns for detecting diagonal and trigonal walls. We created an entity detection system that fits our design goals. There are some lingering questions in the math, though. It's, it's, it's going to bug me. I might tackle it again in like another seven years, maybe. I don't know. Um... I def I'm too tired to tackle it now. Like, I'm just happy I found something that works. So, you know, don't look the gift horse in the mouth. All good, okay? For now, though, the result is a happy eyeball. With the gift of sight, this little guy is going to be snitching on every player that passes through, including the ones who don't hit the subscribe button. This is my first time ever trying to edit a video, like, ever. So if you think I did an okay job, maybe a little bit of support would be nice. I've got some projects in the works that I'm kind of excited about, and you won't want to miss them. Also, like, I I'm going to be honest here, like, back when I was like a little kid in elementary school, I did try making a couple YouTube videos, and I just didn't have a good enough computer for it, and I also sucked at it. Um, looking back, I'm almost a little bit proud of how, like, unscared I was of it, uncompared to now, but... You know, those were just like these simple little things in elementary school that I tried to do and kind of just failed. With this, like, this is my first real video. Like, the first one where I actually think has a real chance. And, you know, it's just, it's a cool moment for me. So, thanks for being here for it. Bye.